Welcome world to Nobody's a Nobody podcast with me, Mike McVeigh. That's right, this is the podcast where we talk to various people who might be considered nobodies in their field, but are actually quite interesting. I've met these people in some way, some fashion, and they've intersected my life, and I find them absolutely fascinating, and I want to share their stories with you. We will be having a very special episode this week with Jarvix, my friend, the music man himself, the one who provides the hot dog song of the week with Jarvix. He'll be talking about how he started playing the ukulele, about his blog, makeoklahomaweirder.com, and we'll be going over not one, not two, but three songs that he has been a part of that I have enjoyed for one reason or another, and I am looking so forward to introducing you to Jarvix himself. Let me just take a second and mention how much fun this is to make this podcast. I decided to go ahead and move forward with this last month, and this has been one of the most fulfilling things I have done in my life. I have absolutely enjoyed getting back into contact with some friends I haven't talked to as recently, getting to hear their stories, what's going on. We've already had really good response, much better than I was expecting. I make jokes about how few people listen to this, but I've already more than more than met all my expectations and my true goals on this. So please keep listening. If you have feedback for me, I would love to hear it. You can either email me at mike.w.mcveigh at gmail.com or if you have another way of contact me on Facebook or Instagram, feel free to let me know. I will always take your suggestions. I might not agree with them, might not use them, but I'll be more than happy to listen to what you have to say. If you need an organization to support because you don't know what to do, feel free to support OneOKC.org. That's O-N-E-O-K-C.org. They help everybody out from elementary school to adults and to try to help create the world in a better way. It's here in Oklahoma City. It's an organization I feel very, very passionate about. We also want to keep on supporting those businesses that treat people like people, that Uh, make great food so if you know those kinds of places let me know if you're interested in submitting a song for Jarvix to recognize some local artists that might not get some of the same fanfare just let me know we we want to make this show as enjoyable for you as possible though it's still going to be my show well unless you guys steal it from me please don't steal it from me There's some great interviews coming up, and we have one coming up right now with Jarvik. So let's just get in the middle of that conversation with him. I first got to meet you was when we were at an open mic a few years ago, and me and uh, Dr. John decided to go and pretend like we knew how to play guitar and sing and whatnot, and you were up there and you're singing, uh, you're ruining the movie, which we'll be playing in a little bit, but... um, Set the stage of how a man picks up a ukulele and goes to open mic nights. Um, yeah. Well, first you you get the ukulele, <laughs> and, and then you get sort of the courage to do it. Um, for me, it was definitely not the other way around. Um, the ukulele itself is kind of interesting because. I the only reason I ever even picked up the uke in the first place was because there was a sale at a music shop and they were selling ukes for 50 bucks and I thought hey that might be cool and I went down there and um, I ended up getting a, a pretty decent ukulele that was normally I think $200 and it was marked down substantially and the only thing that was wrong with it was cosmetics like it printed weird or something and so I just I picked it up I played around with it you know I taught myself through some online uh, lessons and sheets and stuff and I just um, enjoyed it a lot and you know I had tried to take piano lessons and you know I was in high school band and all that stuff I played French horn but ukulele really spoke to me in a way that the other instruments didn't And I just, I gravitated to it and I started writing songs for it. And then, you know, I started recording things um, because I I was always more interested in the compositional side of music than the performance side of it. But after a certain point, I sort of kind of got really curious about what what would I do if I went kind of public with this? Um, Because I was sort of doing everything anonymously on the internet and getting a lot of good feedback from people outside of, you know, where I lived. 
just people on the internet on SoundCloud who were also into weird stuff like I was. <laughs> you know, I, I made some friends from other states and um, it was just really cool to, you know, sort of be validated in a way with an art that I didn't always feel I was very worthy of, I guess. And, you know, everybody, it seems like you have to know how to play guitar, you know? Or you have to be like a virtuoso <laughs> in some way. And here I am, this kid with a ukulele. And ukulele kind of gets a bad reputation in some music circles as not a real musician's instrument. But I sort of learned that that wasn't true and just tried to, tried to you know, work with it and bring my own spin to that instrument. And I just decided um, I was going to finally go out there and I was going to try an open mic and it was at this new coffee shop that I had never really been to and I thought great nobody's gonna know me I'm gonna be totally anonymous <laughs> and if I if I screw this up so bad you know I I just won't ever do it again <laughs> and this will be this thing that I I just closed the chapter on but then I did it and I was really scared but I kind of liked it and I thought, okay, I, I had stage fright and I was definitely, you know, not used to it, but, you know, I, I ended up coming back and then I came back and, you know, the more you do something, the better you get at it. And so by the time you saw me, I had probably a half dozen open mics under my belt and I was, uh, you know, still nervous and still green with everything. I was just playing a soprano uke acoustically. I was first, I first had the pleasure of getting to see you play the week after Guardians of the Galaxy was released in the movie theater. Because I specifically remember <laughs> right. on the way in to, what was the name of that place? Uh, it's where... Uh, is it uh, District House that we're talking about? No, this is before District House. Or it was uh, paramount cafe paramount. yeah paramount yeah because uh, i saw paramount. dr john and we were talking about it and we were talking about whether or not we'd let our kids watch guardians of the galaxy because it was rougher on language of all things sure. than some of the other marvel movies and when we walked in uh, it was a we saw this guy with a red hat with a fish on it uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> and of course your <laughs> trademark ties uh, these big ties uh -huh. and you just go and you have this very melodic voice uh, I think it's and a interesting tiny mentioned... instrument. <laughs> a tiny instrument, yes. Yeah. In fact, I think you might be the most famous ukulele player since Adam Sandler from the early '90s. And <laughs> <Wow. There's... laughs> granted, you're only the second ukulele player I know um, that's famous. Okay, in my mind at least. <laughs> yeah, there's there's certainly some, but it's uh, yeah. A lot of people see it see it as a secondary instrument, if anything. But there's a few who consider it a primary instrument. But not very many. Let's start with the song that introduced me to you, Ruining the Movie by Jarvix. Ruining the Movie. Tell me about this. Okay. There was a line that was similar to that that stuck out to me. And I was like, you know, that would make a cool song. And it just, it kind of stuck out because it was metaphoric at the time. And I sort of just f uh, fleshed out and embellished that metaphor. So. I mean, literally ruining the movie is about, hey, don't interrupt other people's experiences. <laughs> you know, like if if you're in a room with other people trying to enjoy a film, like don't ruin it. And it's funny because AMC theaters, you know, started running a pre-show promo thing that was like, don't ruin the movie. Right. And I always think of my own song now. All right, well, let's listen to Ruining the Movie by Jarvix from his album Toe Tunes. Thank you. 
You make too much noise, they'll find you. I said, don't you dare go up here and down that hallway. I said, don't go there. They've been staking it out all day. the draw if this isn't gonna turn out I said there's a flaw and our love is gonna burn out I said why should I try to save a ship that's sinking I said justify your dreamy, wishful thinking kind of interesting even though there were some other things going on in my life at the time that I met you you were in a sense kind of a bridge for several relationships I have now uh, Amanda was one who was at that show as well I don't know yeah. if you knew her before then but that definitely through uh, the Paramount and the District House I got to know her Dylan yeah um, yeah and at that same time there were a few overlappings because I was really big into the Phil Spectres at the time and right there's, I know there's some shows that you went to to go see the other bands that were playing with them, and I was there to go see the Phil Spectres. And so we kind of kept meeting up and right. places, not just at the open mics, which was great. Yeah. And one of the things that you aren't just a musician, you also happen to do some other stuff with music. Yes. <laughs> like that. <laughs> um, which, uh, which part of it would you like to discuss? I don't know um, which part. <laughs> make Oklahoma weirder. Um, the blog well, I run now. Uh, what what inspired the whole make Oklahoma weirder uh, right. blog and website? So it was kind of a few factors that came together. So, um, kind of continuing that thread of myself musically, 
Um, Jarvix was becoming a thing. You know, I was going to open mics, but I was also starting to actually get shows and gigs. And, you know, I would do my looping pedal stuff. And, uh, you know, it, it allowed me to kind of be both a singer songwriter, but also a one man band. And so, you know, I started to play some shows here and there. And I thought, man, I should really get some merchandise. You know, I had CDs for sale um, from some music I had recorded by myself, but I hadn't really, you know, gotten anything other than that. So I, I got some stickers and I got some t-shirts made and I had this idea um, early on. I used to, you know, sketch ideas for merchandise. And one of them was just make Oklahoma weirder. Like that sounds like a cool slogan that I could get behind because, you know, a guy with a fish hat and a necktie, um, you know, it's pretty on brand. So I thought, you know, this would be cool. And around that time, um, I also, uh, in the Plaza district, there's a store called Dig It. And it's kind of a, a vintage store, but they also have a lot of local art. And um, one of my musical contacts, um, his name is gosh uh clinton avery tharp he's in a band called the dirty little bettys uh he let me know that they were looking for a uh, local band merch and i thought okay uh maybe maybe people here will like my make oklahoma weirder shirts and they liked them a lot and i knew it wasn't because they liked me because a lot of the people who were buying them had no idea who i was they just really liked the shirts right right <laughs> So, so that's sort of one of the things that led to it. That's where, that's where Make Oklahoma Weirder as a phrase came from. Um, as far as the writing side of it, so um, I've always been interested in writing. And, you know, I took a couple of journalism courses, but I didn't really pursue it because I knew it wasn't a very good way to make money <laughs> or a very good living. And that's certainly more true now than ever. But, uh, it was always something that interested me. I wrote it. I wrote for my, you know, high school newspaper and all that. And um, I basically just saw a need that wasn't being filled. Um, this would have been circa 2015, 2016. Right. I uh, I started writing for a local blog called. Um, it was run by Literati Press. Um, they aren't doing a blog anymore, but they have a bookstore that's in the Paseo district and they do a lot of cool stuff yeah, as, a, great as a books. local. Yeah. You know about literati. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I bought a few of their books. And uh, last year at the book fair, I got to talk to the uh, guy in charge and a couple of his staff members and yeah. just, yeah, those are some great guys and they do some great work. So that's really yeah, cool. I, did, I, I, I know I read that sure. in your bio, but I never even thought about the fact that that was that same group. So that's awesome. Yeah, it was the same group. And that's actually a connection with Dr. John, too, uh, who we mentioned earlier, where he had written some stuff for him. And that's kind of how we connected okay. early on. He and I, we just randomly, you know, ran into each other in the vicinity of a Literati Press booth, you know. Um, but, uh, you know, I had made some acquaintances there um, through people like John. And... Um, uh, they just basically asked me if I would be interested in, you know, throwing some stuff together for their blog just to do it. And I was like, okay, well, I have a platform now. What do I do with it? <laughs> and as a complete outsider musician, you know, like my parents aren't really musicians. You know, my dad can't carry a tune. <laughs> my mom hasn't done anything since she played flute in high school. Like, I, didn't, I wasn't brought up in the music scene, you know, right. I had to, I had to find it myself. Um, and so I felt like a total outsider. There was a lot of stuff I didn't know. And I sort of realized that I wasn't alone. There's a lot of people who are not necessarily, necessarily clued in to all the clicks that are around. And um, around that time, there wasn't a lot of press and arguably there's even less now but if you wanted to get written about you know if you wanted somebody to review your album or you know do an interview with you you had to know the right people right. and it's hard to it's hard to know the right people 
if you don't know who they are, you know? <laughs> and so um, I just, I, I felt a certain need to reach out to what I felt like wasn't being covered and what was being missed out on. Cause you know, um, it, I, I feel like at any given time, there's probably 10 to 20 bands or artists that are just constantly being written about. And then there's tons of other people who just get no attention. Uh, right. it, it, I wouldn't even necessarily say that's a mainstream thing. That's just all together. And, you know, um, I, I could talk about this for a long time, but basically I just, I felt like there was a need and I made an attempt to fill it and people liked it. Um, they were appreciating that somebody was, you know, kind of reaching out to genres that don't always get written about and artists that don't get written about and that I was doing it in a pretty sensible fashion, you know, mm -hmm. like, yeah. I, I was constructively critical as needed. Like I wasn't just giving everybody a five star review, you know? So, you know, I, I sort of learned from that. And then Charles Martin is the guy who runs literati and he edited all my stuff really early on and kind of gave me some pointers about, well, here's what you do. Here's what you don't do. And, you know, of course he knows what he's talking about. He's <laughs> written for all kinds of things. Right. So, um, so that was that. I, I wrote for Literati, and then I wrote for Cellador Music Group for a while. And I was, I was the managing editor, editor there for uh, a year or two. It was about a couple of years. Um, but then the person who ran that website moved out of state. And so I was sort of at a crossroads where, okay, what do I want to do? I want to keep writing about this stuff. Um, do I try and find another platform or do I create my own? And I, I looked at what was available to me. I looked at, you know, who was potentially, you know, offering a platform like that. And I just, I knew I wouldn't be able to get away with the stuff I was getting away with um, in terms of covering a bunch of weirdos that nobody <laughs> talks about, you know? Right. Um, so, I don't, I don't want to just write articles for the sake of selling magazines, you know? Mm -hmm. I actually want to do it because it's what I think needs to be done. And, you know, whenever you cater to the numbers, whenever you serve that lowest common denominator, you miss out on all the interesting tidbits along the way, in my opinion. Right. So I just, I just decided, okay, I want to start my own thing. And this happened around the time that I was selling t-shirts at Dig It. So I was like, well, what do I call it? And the two just became one. And so now Make Oklahoma Weirder is both, you know, a merchandise line, but it's no longer a Jarvix thing. It's an entire music scene thing. It's, it's my blog, um, but it's also almost a movement in a way. So... Uh -oh. It's uh, <laughs> that's that's the long story, but uh, I thought it was a bit necessary to kind of go through it. Yeah. And I've been I've been doing that for a couple of years now. Um, I have dubbed myself the chief executive weirdo. Yes, definitely. I feel weird claiming to be anything that sounds too official. But, <laughs> uh, um, but that's that's kind of it. Um, it's so, you know it's a yeah what. So has it been a challenge reviewing other bands while and other music groups while you are trying to still create your own kind of music or mm. like, has that given you any blowback or has that been all a okay. general positive affair? <laughs> yeah, that's a, that's a really good question because it is tricky when you're reviewing your peers, essentially. Um, I, uh, I will say I've lost a couple of bridges over this. Um, there's a couple of people who were, I would just say were acquaintances mm -hmm. that, um, due to not wanting to play favorites or due to, you know, being honest in a professional capacity led to us not really talking anymore. Right. But for the most part, um, I, I have a pretty decent radar about, who's going to take things hard and personally and who's going to 
you know, appreciate what I'm doing and understand that it comes from a place of support and I'm not trying to tear anybody down. Um, and I try to, I try to gauge all my writings, you know, to each individual artist. And I try to really understand where everybody comes from so that it's not just my personal tastes. Like I've really had to listen to a lot of music that I probably normally wouldn't listen to, but it helps me understand, you know, everybody else's perspectives a bit better. And so um, it's definitely a challenge to balance that. I think I've done an okay job with that. Um, If anything, I think it's probably helped me a bit um, to be a bit more visible uh, because I do make an effort to reach out to as many people as I can. I've played multiple hip hop shows, for instance, and I'm not really a hip hop artist, you know. Yet. <laughs> um, well, yet. I've played a couple <laughs> of raps, actually. Um, but uh, yeah, it's uh, it's not really my forte, but I, you know, just just through the connections that I've made, you know, I've ended up hosting a hip hop show one time. I was a judge at a hip hop competition one time. You know, and this is stuff that never would have happened if it weren't for, you know, being an active supporter and blogger in the music scene. So it's uh, I the probably the hardest thing is just trying to keep my own bias in check because I obviously have a lot of friends in the music scene at this point. Mm -hmm. And I really try not to just write about my friends. Because once you do that, then you're doing what everybody else has done. Because that's why I couldn't get written about in the beginning because, you know, I didn't have the right friends. And the people who were writing wrote about their friends, you know. Right. That that wasn't 100% always true, but it was definitely a trend. And so I always always try to check myself and keep myself um, objective as much as possible. And I think that has really helped a lot because if anybody ever tries to accuse me of playing favorites or, you know, if there's ever any drama that anyone wants to start with me, um, there's, there's not a lot of basis for it, at least so far. And the drama that has happened, um, didn't didn't carry very far right because you know fire needs oxygen there's no oxygen sometimes if your stuff is just um, unfounded you you cut out there you you cut out there you said fire needs oxygen and then it uh, i think you turned your phone or something oh sorry Um, that's okay yeah fire needs oxygen it's it's Um, still uh unfortunately i can't fix your audio on this side hello hello can you hear I, me? I can hear you, but you're muffled. It's like from the difference from muffled. this and there you go. Well, when you said muffled, it sounded good. Muffled. Hello. Check one. There hey. Right there. That sounds good. Right there. Yes, okay. Sir. Sorry. <laughs> um, okay. Well, uh, I mean, that's pretty much what I was saying. Um, it's, it's a challenge, but I try to mitigate it as much as possible. I try, I try to keep those two things separate and, one thing I've also really tried to do is not to use my own platform as a way to promote my own music. I feel like that's in bad taste. (laughs) Is that difficult (laughs) to like, you know, write it? What's that? Is that difficult difficult to to do that yourself? I mean, so it's kind of, no, uh, because I never want to promote myself. You never want to promote yourself. Not really. I do it because I have to, um, I don't have enough of an ego to do that. I can definitely relate to that. It's been, that's one reason why it's taken me so long to do the podcast because it always felt very selfish to kind of say, Hey, I'm going to start something and I want you all to listen to me, but that's not really my goal. I I, I definitely want people to listen and I don't mind a little bit of a mini fame that I get from that, you know, uh, if nothing else, reconnecting with several friends, because unlike you, I'm actually trying to contact my friends and people who I know definitely first <laughs> to interview and whatnot. But I, I definitely can under, I can empathize with not necessarily enjoying a style of music, uh, but still being able to appreciate the quality of it, both on, and then also music that you might love to death, 
might not actually be that great of music, but you still love it. Yeah, uh, absolutely. In the nineties, there is a guy who started rising to fame in the comedy world. He kind of broke out of stand-up comedy and made it to movies uh, named Jim Carrey. And he's considered, you know, one I've of, heard of that guy. <laughs> yeah. He's, he's done a few movies. He, he made a little bit of money here and there, but I never really liked his style of humor. It, it wasn't that it wasn't good. It was, I always appreciated it because I've studied a lot of comedy, but he just wasn't my style. And I remember getting in an argument with a friend saying, yeah. and he's like, he's the funniest guy in the world. He's like, well, he is funny, but I don't like him. He's like, how can you not like him and say he's funny? I said, because you can appreciate somebody's <laughs> contribution without actually yeah. liking it. I mean, I'm not going to deny the fact yeah. of what he's done for comedy and for stand up and whatnot. There, there's some really good stuff, but he's not, he's not my style of comedy. Uh, I'm, when I go into that direction, I'm going to look more at like a Robin Williams, uh, uh, even, even though it's just funny cause Jim Carrey's model was Robin Williams and a uh, guy from Oklahoma, Bill Hader, Jim Carrey was his inspiration. So it's kind of funny. I, I like the guy that preceded Jim Carrey and the guy who followed Jim Carrey, but I'm not really a Jim Carrey fan. So that's kind of a interesting side note, but, <laughs> uh, what, what it's a good thing I can edit stuff to be able to have the fortitude to give honest interviews about both the music you like, but isn't necessarily quality and the quality you don't necessarily like what kind of has propelled you to do that? Because that's a very difficult thing to do. It's, it's very difficult for me to, um, probably punish my daughter appropriately when she deserves it <laughs> or discipline. Sorry, not punish, punish discipline. But because I love her so much, how do you, how are you able to, what, what, what's the impetus to make you move forward and kind of give honest reviews despite everything else? Right. Um, well, one thing I can say up front is I'm not always a hundred percent honest. I, I don't let, people know everything that's on my mind. Um, I've <laughs> definitely written about some things, you know, uh, where I, I, I sort of leave certain things out and I, I tend to be really, whenever I say I do constructive criticism, I try to measure it for each artist so that it's not just, okay, for the people who are reading, I want them to be able to get the essence of the album and to know sort of, you know, the positives and the negatives, but I don't want to just completely rake an artist ever. Right. And if, if I'm ever going to do that, I'm going to be really uh, hesitant to do that um, because it's, it's different when you're reviewing somebody who's, you know, local kind of not out there yet. Someone who's maybe just starting out or somebody who, you know, doesn't have a lot of experience with criticism yet. Like right. you, you don't want to discourage somebody early on. If you think they're doing something good, you want to help them get better. And so I try to balance that out as best I can so that I can, you know, be honest and let people know, Hey, this album may not appeal to you if you like this, but it may appeal to you if you like this sometimes using that kind of language can give you an idea of what I'm really feeling on it. Right. Um, I also tend to like a lot of stuff. <laughs> yes, so that do. helps too. Um, That's I, I've learned even to like a lot of stuff. And so it, it helps to, you know, be positive. Because... Okay. Whoop. Oh, you cut out there. You said be positive, and then it cut out. Yeah, I completely disappeared. Where are we? You're you're back. Uh, you're back. Okay, I, I think my I phone battery's dying. I'm at oh. like fourteen percent. Okay. Well, um, we'll, we'll get it down to one percent. I think we can keep going. <laughs> we'll see. Uh, uh, one of the things. So that I like I, a lot of stuff. One of the things that I've noticed about you, even early on, is that you are very accepting and embrace different whatever is different from 
not necessarily just how who you are, which a lot of people would say that, and that might be true as well, because you know, wearing a fish on your hat, always having a ridiculous tie that becomes less and less ridiculous the more we see you. The <laughs> the pictures that you take that that you do promote yourself, but you 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 are willing to go and I would almost say the word embrace, not just find interest in, but you'll go embrace something that's different just to really try to experience what that might be, whether it be a movie, TV show, music, uh, people. Would you, well, one, I would say, would you agree with that? And two, why? <laughs> right. Um, I would agree with that to an extent. I think there's definitely a certain capacity limit there. Um, where after a while I need to get back to my zone and really get back to what I enjoy and to sort of recharge my battery. But, um, I do, as long as I'm capable, try to, you know, a lot of it's listening, a lot of it's, you know, just listening and trying to understand other points of view. And it's, uh, I, I don't know if I always enjoy it. But it's, it's something I, I always try to consider, I guess, um, beyond my initial instincts. You know, I, I've had conversations with people before that, you know, your first thought is, is your true thought. But I tend to have multiple voices that kind of go at once. So I try to make sure they all get heard. And I sort of, you know, feel everything out. I don't know. Um, what was the second question? Why, why, why do you seek, seek that and do that? Um, well, especially with music, I think that's where I do it more than anything is with music. Um, I just, uh, like if I'm listening to stuff personally for like my own personal enjoyment, it's, it's something that I do gravitate to certain things and I'll try other stuff. I think food's probably a good example. I'll try <laughs> any food. I will try anything um, that I can't, I can't think of anything that I wouldn't try. I might be really hesitant. There's some, there's some really, really odd stuff out there in the culinary world, but there's, there's very little that I don't like. Um, and there's um, very little that I haven't tried. And that's just because, I believe in, you know, giving everything, not just a first chance, but even a second chance. And you never know what you might be missing out on, I guess. So I try to, I try to um, just not live in a bubble, I guess. <laughs> I really, I really try to make sure that I'm aware that there are other things out there. And I mean, I, I I don't even feel like I have anything on a lot of other people. I mean, there's some people who just have all kinds of understandings of all kinds of cultures and everything. And I've never even traveled outside of the country. Um, like there's a lot of rich experiences that I haven't had, but I guess maybe I let some of those things come to me in a way, you know, mm -hmm. virtually or just through other people sharing their experiences with me um, and sort of getting a second or third hand awareness of things. Um, so let me uh, move this. All, even though, the, First of all, I love talking to you. It's not, okay. even, it's not even a question on I, that. I, like I feel your, like I'm boring right now, no, but okay. oh, you're not boring me. I can't speak for oh, everybody okay. else. I, I do want to ask you a few questions. I'm, I've heard this on other podcasts. So I'm going to try. It's kind of like a lightning question round where I haven't prepared you for any of these questions and you kind of just get oh. the answer that goes with it. And I also want to make sure to talk about some of your specific songs that we'll be featuring on this podcast today. But okay. But yeah. the first question I'm going to ask is actually based on something you just mentioned about trying different kinds of food for someone like me, who is a very base eater and I don't go out very far from the basics what would you say is the weirdest thing that you've ever tried food wise uh that's a tough one um what comes to mind is fish eyes fish eyes <laughs> yeah 
which wasn't really even a menu item. There was a fish that had an eye, and I was like, let's eat the eye. And it was gross. <laughs> and I haven't had a fish eye since. Well, but, I might answer the second part is, what's the um, worst food you've ever tried? Just to... <laughs> <laughs> um, it's kind of odd. Like, the stuff that I don't like um, is not always the most gross-out stuff, you know? Um, like, I mean, I, I love all forms of seafood, for instance. And, okay. you know, like ceviche and stuff like that would certainly weird some people out. You know, I'll eat octopus and things. Mm -hmm. But LaCroix sparkling water i do not like you know like <laughs> i'm not a fan of sparkling stuff. water <laughs> i like water right. i like flavored water but you know the topo chico and all that i just I, I grew up on well water and i just i can't with that stuff so there's there's a few oddball things in there um but so i think what you're saying the fish eye is, is definitely the well water there. has completely distorted everything about your taste <laughs> A little bit. I mean, I, I'll still drink water, but what town yeah, that's you, a thought. I don't know. What town did you grow up in? I know Oklahoma has lots of different well water cities. Oh, sure. Well, so I, I grew up in the Moore public school system, <laughs> but I was technically in um, Oklahoma City. Okay. I lived out by, uh, what's the lake that's east of Moore? I forget. Uh, There's a lake out there. Yeah, Thunderbird. Um, I don't think it's – is it Thunderbird? I, I can't remember. I was out that way. We went fishing a few times. Um, I didn't live on the lake, but I was in the country, just far enough in the country that uh, if I wanted to take the bus, you know, it would be a bus that picked up eight kids and took an hour and a half to get to school. Like uh, Stanley Draper. Um, Stanley Draper, that's it. Yeah. Um, Google Maps for the win. So, you know – I barely fell in the more public school district and I kind of grew up out there. So we had, you know, we had a big backyard and we had a well and a little house out there. It was apparently a really good deal. Um, I was born to like, you know, a trailer park kind of set up. Um, but um, I was there for the bulk of my childhood. And then after that, it's all been apartments. Okay. In, until this year but right. uh that, that's where i grew up i grew up in more more or less all right so now we're going to get to the i guess lightning round for better lack of better term okay. but that definitely is going to okay. change in future podcasts all these right. are questions that i had on facebook i asked people if you're going to be interviewed what would you like to have be asked oh by the i love this so, yes <laughs> if you were a tree what kind of pizza would you eat <laughs> <laughs> nice um geez uh how does a how does a tree eat pizza it, it would have to like consume it through uh decom decomposed soil i guess so what pizza makes the most rich soil for a tree that's your um, answer not mine <laughs> right um I guess I'd probably go for something that's like not processed and like super organic and gluten free and all that stuff. <laughs> Even though as a human, you know, that's not what I would go for. Um, so no sparkling I, water I'm for treat you. <laughs> sparkling water. Right. Pizza. <laughs> um, I don't think I don't think I would want sparkling water in any life <laughs> of anything. Um, but uh, yeah, I don't know. All right. um, there's a there's a restaurant up here called uh, Stone Sisters that they, they have a pizza shop. So I'm going to say I would want a pizza from those gals. All right. Now, that was that question was submitted by Rashad. I've got a question nice. from our friend Amanda. If you were to leave this life tomorrow, what's the one thing you would like people to have known about you? Oh, very Amanda ish. Um, right. Yeah. That's, that's deep. Um, I mean, I don't think I'd really care. Um, <laughs> honestly, I mean, at that point I'm in a whole nother plane of existence or whatever. So, um, 
I, I would hope that people would remember that I was mostly a nice guy and that I hopefully led a life that made things better than if I weren't here at all. And I think if, if that were the baseline, I would be content with that. All right. What's been the most, this is from my friend, Lamanda, uh, also goes by Mandy. What's the, what's been the most influential book in your life? Ooh, see, I used to read a lot, but I don't really read anymore. <laughs> and it's, I'm deeply ashamed of it. Um, but I just, for it, and that's a personal fault, but I used to read a lot of classics, but man, you know, it's usually not books that change my life. Um, I've read, you know, dozens of books, but it's, it's usually more for entertainment and I okay. haven't, by the time I was really getting into like some deep stuff, it was films that were doing it for me. Okay. Well, let's, so let's, let's change that. What's been the um, most influential film in your life? For the record, I would probably say my most influential book uh, would be a uh, best of collection of poems by Billy Collins. Okay. Um, who's a wonderful poet, but uh, yeah, film films is probably a bit more my taste and I, whew, there's, there's a lot of them, but, um, you know, I mean, some of my favorites that have really stuck with me and always been kind of iconic, um, it's hard. Um, <laughs> I used to say that network was my favorite film okay. from the seventies, uh -huh. which was very cynical. But, you know, I really enjoyed the way that it portrayed media and how prophetic it was. Like, it really spoke to me in that way. Mm -hmm. um, on, like, a personal level, um, I identify a lot with uh, – there's a film called 127 Hours, okay. which I've only seen once. But it was uh, a Danny Boyle film where uh, it's about the guy who uh, got trapped – out in the outdoors right. apart from civilization had to saw his own arm off and it at that particular time i was at a point in my life where i wasn't sure if i was going to be a social person at all or if i was going to give in to my curmudgeonly side and become a complete um home like uh what's what's the term i'm looking for Homebody? Um, homebody, but more like somebody who's just completely shuts themselves off from society. Okay, gotcha. Um, yeah, there's, there's a couple terms that aren't coming to mind, but well, I'm um, I was of going to social conversion of sorts now. <laughs> yeah, and I mean, I still have those tendencies, but it was um, <clears throat> just some, for me, it was a really beautiful way of portraying that you know, it's okay to ask for help. It's okay to need people and you don't have to be 100% alone. And, you know, I think at that point in my life, I was really wondering who I was and what I was doing and all of that. And it was, it was one of those things that's kind of part of a whole, um, a whole collection of things that kind of led me on a path to where I am now. But it, uh, I would say it and a few other things were kind of pivotal to just like being aware of my own humanity in a way that, uh, uh, yeah. And it's, you know, you don't have to, I don't know. I think, I think I've probably talked about it enough, but you have, is, <laughs> yeah. um, and I do apologize to Amy out there. That was your question, not Mandy's Mandy's question. I only have two more for you and then we'll get into music. Uh, Mandy's question is how have you learned to get along so well with people who think and believe so differently than you? Uh, you're uh, soft right there. Uh, so that one's actually tailored to me. I didn't know if these were just general questions. They are general questions, but it's, it's she's kind of a presuming that I am that way. Um, <laughs> can, can you repeat that question for me? Yeah. How have you learned to get along so well with people who think and believe so differently than you? 
Yeah, that's very presumptuous. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, I've tried. Um, honestly, a lot of it is just my own personal experiences. As I tried to make clear earlier where, you know, once I sort of saw things from the outside in, once you work your way in, you want to make sure you don't forget about where you came from, you know? Mm -hmm. And so I, I've always been a misunderstood person, you know, uh, from my very, very youngest years. Um, I've always been an oddball. I've always been someone who uh, both perceived things differently and expressed things differently. And a lot of people misunderstood me. And so uh, it's always been an effort of mine to help prevent that from happening to other people as much as possible because you know communication is key and you know i think if we if everybody were better at it the world would be a better place you know right and so i would say that's probably like on a very deep subconscious level that's probably where it comes from and right. i just always try to hold on to that all right this last question is a yes or no question and it's from my friend adrian it's the most bizarre of all of these, so <laughs> it's Great. in the spirit of Great. Harry Carey, and I'm going to do my best impression, but it'll be horrible, I'm sure. If you were a donut, would you eat yourself? <laughs> ah, see, I know some donut experts. Um, uh, <laughs> see, I'm taking these questions too seriously. That's okay. That's who I have you are, to, man. <laughs> I, have to, I have to ponder how a donut would eat oneself. And like, would it be, I mean, that's, it's basically cannibalism. So I'm going to, I'm going to just treat it like a cannibal question, I guess. If, if I were delicious and I could eat myself, would I do it? Um, if presuming that I don't have the ability to regenerate, if I could regenerate, yes, the answer is yes. <laughs> I love um, it. But if if, if I did not, <laughs> if I did not, then I, I would probably try it at some point, but I wouldn't eat all of myself. I might just eat a part of myself that I think I can maybe live without. So like, uh, like, a, I don't know. <laughs> a, a donut is so round, like which part would you even start with? But yeah, Very I would take a bite out of myself. Tribune. I would do it. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> I hope you like that answer. I do. I do. All right. <laughs> okay. The next song that we're going to be talking about is OK, which is also the Campfire song by Dylan Kentworth, which features Jarvix. Now, this is one of my all time favorite songs, period. There's some great ukulele work in there, and I believe that you're the ukulele expert. So, Talk to me about wow. how how this song came together and your part in That was the part that I played in this particular song. Um, at the time, it was kind of one of those, you know, I think you can hear it in the recording. It was one of those lightning in a bottle moments in a way. Um, Dylan and I were really close. Uh, we had, you know, we would visit each other and work on recordings and things. And, you know, we, we sort of mentored each other as we were both you know, we met in the open mic scene, so we oh, kind of really? came up around the same time. And uh, it was just one of those things where, you know, he had this song idea and he was like, hey, this would be really cool with some ukulele. And, you know, I had two to toe tunes out at that point, which is where that last song was from. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, he gave me the chords and I kind of, you know, felt my way around it and just, you know, provided what I thought, you know, reflected the, the feel of the song. And I mean, all the songwriting credit goes to him for sure. Right, right. But it was a really interesting moment where everything just clicked. And, you know, there's a little part at the end of that song that was completely spontaneous. <laughs> yes. We, we didn't plan for that at all. So, you know, we just wanted to make a song that was, you know, nice and easygoing and uh, relaxing for people, you know? Let's go ahead and listen to OK Campfire Song by Dylan Kentworth featuring Jarvix. Oh, 
episode features is hot dog the hot dog song with jarvix and this week we're actually going to be featuring jarvix so jarvix tell us about the song for this episode what do we have today all right i'm i'm breaking my rule here for you i never want to promote myself with my own platform but here we are um, doomsday carnations is the song it's um it's a song that i put out a couple months ago uh, and it, it was it was March, mid March, late March, and uh, it's it's the first recording that I've put out in a little while. It was pretty sudden. Um, basically, it's it's written in response to all the coronavirus stuff, COVID nineteen, and everything, twenty twenty. Um, 
I, I at the time was working at a music venue in Oklahoma City called Tower Theater, mm-hmm. which um, is an excellent, excellent venue and a great place to work too. Um, but understandably due to the situation, um, I was, I was out of work for a little while and I was just thinking about, you know, uh, honestly, I was thinking about the end of the world. (laughs) I've written a few songs about the end of the world. Actually, (laughs) they just sound a little bit happier than you might think. But, um, this one in particular was just, I was, I was really contemplating the role of art and the role of, you know, expression and creativity um whenever uh you know whenever things get really nasty out there and whenever you know i mean the first thing to go in schools is always art education you know it's the music classes it's not deemed as essential and you know whenever you're down to the bare essentials you know there's there's all this talk about what essential work is and what essential businesses are and you know the notion that music is one of the least essential things in that I like, I know that it's, I I understand that there's a difference, but it just, it struck me a certain way. And I was kind of pondering, you know, what, what is it like, you know, after a certain point when nobody values your art, do you continue to do it or do you eventually give in or what? And I sort of translated my role as, you know, and a musician to um, someone who's at the end of uh, kind of in the apocalypse, more or less, uh, who is a florist. And so this song is about it's it's from the perspective of perspective of someone whose art was, you know, arranging flowers and making them, you know, pretty, um, for lack of a better word, suitable for a certain you know visual purpose. And whenever that purpose is gone, you know, what, what purpose does it serve at that point? And, right. uh, so I was thinking all about a lot of heavy stuff. And so you can kind of hear it in the mixing of this, you know, I definitely, I recorded this at home and I sampled some number stations and things, um, which is a whole nother topic, but, um, that's basically what it's about. And it's about, you know, holding on to beauty and holding on to expression in the midst of, you know, hardship and ultimately concluding that, you know what, there is beauty there still in the darkness and it's up to us to make sure it thrives and survives. And, you know, as an artist, I will continue to, you know, I'll make music till I die. I just (laughs) will, whether people listen to it or not, you know, like that's, that's my that's my offering as a human to to the you know to the world so right. that's kind of what it's about but you know i put it through a different character and uh yeah that's that's the story behind it and it's it's uh uh if you want to hear the see the lyrics there's some lyrics on my bandcamp page which we'll probably plug at the end of the show but um, All right. doomsday well, carnations it's literally about doomsday carnations well, let's listen to Doomsday Carnations by Jarvix. <laughs> Tourist in a place that I used to call home, and 
So I indulge in creation when there's only destruction around. I trim and arrange my carnations and I lay my bouquets on the ground. And I Is there anything else you would like to say before we cut this interview completely off? Thank you for asking, because not everyone does. Um, yeah, there's there's a lot. I'm not sure when this is going to air or what's going on right now um, at the time that this is airing. I know at the time that we're recording this, um, there's a lot happening. Um, we're in the middle of, we're still in the middle of a pandemic, you know, and mm-hmm. I'm still social distancing and um, there's a lot of rioting that has been happening lately with, you know, uh, racial injustices and all that stuff. So it's, it's really heavy times. And, you know, I just, I think it's important 
uh, more now than ever to, to listen and not just to listen to, you know, the people who are around you, but to actually seek out other perspectives and understand that there is, you know, it's a big world and everybody has a different experience and really understand that, you know, um, I have a saying, this is kind of, this is going to be my sort of quirky thing that I do here, but um, if it walks like a duck and it talks like a duck, you might have duck fever. <laughs> so like, you know, some things, what we think we see and understand might not actually be an external thing that we're perceiving. It might be an internal thing that we don't realize is going on. And I mean, just talk to a magician, you know, like <laughs> they know all about making things look different than they are. Um, right. So it's, it's a whole thing. So I just, you know, it's really, really easy to look at something and say, what I see is exactly what is happening, but the truth is often more complicated. And, um, I, I guess that's probably what I would say is, uh, yeah, you might have duck fever. <laughs> well, Jarvix, I'm so glad that we got to feature you as a guest uh, for this episode. I'm even more glad the fact that we're going to continue to have talks about the hot dog song with Jarvix on our each oh, episode. Yeah. I'm excited and, for that. Uh, thank you very much for helping me out with all this. I appreciate it. Yeah, man. Be sure to check out Jarvix at his bandcamp, jarvix.bandcamp.com, or go to makeoklahomaweirder.com and check out his blog. Feel free to support oneokc.org and. This is me, Mike McVeigh, signing off, and I'll talk to you nobodies next week.